Mr. David, lovely to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for making time for us. It's a, it's a real honour. Now, people of all ages and all generations love you and love your work, but young people seem to absolutely love you. Their eyes light up at the mention of your name. What's it like for you to connect so strongly with the younger generation? Uh, well, it's, you know, in, honest, in all honesty, it's not me. It's, it's what I bring with me, that is to say, great shots of the natural world. I mean, that's what excites kids, uh, in, in my experience, anyway. And if you see some of these fabulous sights, I mean, wonderful waterfalls or coral reefs or birds of paradise displaying or something, you know, that, that, that's, that's something, that's real, and that's, that's our world, you know. And I've had the luck of, um, of, of, of introducing that sort of vision for 70 years. I mean, it's just unbelievable, really. OK, we'll speak more about young people in a moment. Particularly, I'd love to get your thoughts on the school climate strikes. Um, but I'd love to go back into your decades in the field. Um, I know uh, from reading about you that your most feared uh, animal is the intoxicated male Homo sapien. But apart from that, what other animals have really put you on edge out in the field? I don't hate many things, but I do hate rats. I, re I really do hate rats. I've had, I've had rats run over my face at night, you know, and that's not too good. Which Australian animals fascinate you? All the corny ones, um, <laughs> uh, really. I mean, you, you'll laugh just because I'm a pom and coming off here. But, I mean, there is, there is nothing more extraordinary than the duckbill platypus. I mean, there really isn't. And it, to my eyes, and sitting on a riverbank in uh, New South Wales somewhere or down in Victoria and seeing one of these things quietly going about its business in a pool and then coming out, mm. I, I mean, it's, it, it, your eyes pop out. I mean, of course, the kangaroo, I mean, all, all those uh, big macropods, all those big marsupials, they're amazing too. They are. I mean, Sorry. they are mind-blowing. And the revelation, I mean, it's interesting, you know, um, I've been in this business long enough. When I first started, nobody had ever seen the vision of a, of a, of a, uh, a little um, neonate, a tiny little creature like a worm, come out of a female and crawl up its fur and go into the pouch. Mm. Uh, I mean, these days, we've, we've all filmed it, we've all done it, uh, and we've all seen it, like, if we wanted to. But it is, that is unbelievable. Absolutely. Let's go under the water, just off the coast of Australia. When did you first go diving at the Great Barrier Reef? What did it look like then, and how much has it changed? I first went in the 50s, late 50s, um, and I would hope it was an underwater swimmer. Mind you, most of us were. I mean, the, the kit you had in the, in the 1950s was pretty primitive stuff, and I wasn't much good at it anyway. But that magical moment, which, which is the Australian's birthright, I mean, it, you do it more than, more than anyone, except perhaps people in Hawaii or somewhere, but, and when you do it on a, on, in a place like a barrier reef, where you have this fantastic paradise of things, which, when you do it for the first time, here, here are 50 creatures that you've never seen before in your life, and all of them are fantastically beautiful, and you don't know the name of any of them, you know, and, and they aren't afraid of you. I mean, what more do you want? And you can go up and go, I'm going to have another look, you can follow them around. I, uh. So that was your initial reaction to diving the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. I know that you went back just 10 years ago. What did you see then? I was looking for evidence of, um, of things going wrong. And we found plenty. I mean, a, a bleached reef is, is a, a tragic sight. I mean, a desperately tragic sight. Particularly if, you, if you've seen it before, you know, uh, and you know what it could have been like. And you just see this acre of, after acre of, 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 of white, pallid, deathly white coral. And for you, was that a real, uh, a real moment, I guess, in your journey of observing climate change? Oh, certainly. Because um, it's one of the permanent things you can see, particularly if you've, been, if you've dived there before. And suddenly you, 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 see, you see that. I mean, that's... That's serious. Yeah, what else have you seen that's really graphically illustrated the impact of climate change? Um, well, that's one of the most graphic because it's one of the most extreme in the sense of, of full of life. I mean, there's nothing fuller of life than, the barrier, than a coral reef. 
I've been to places in um, in the Antarctic or in, in South Georgia, uh, where I, the first time I filmed there in what sixties, seventies, I suppose, uh, and I would see a glacier that was was coming down within a hundred yards of the sea, and, and then you go to the same place and it's way up in the valley. Um, it's very difficult. It's 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 dangerous to to pick particular places because mm. if someone is actually hell bent on proving you wrong, yeah. they'll say, "Well, I can go to a place in the Antarctic where actually there's more ice," and that's quite right. I mean, you can. So the, you have to go. I mean, that's what that's what they call about being objective science. Is well, you have to go and get data from everywhere and see what the overall picture is. But whereas ten years ago, fifteen years ago, people would, would say find it hard to believe. I mean. No, I think hardly anybody can be any doubt that the world is world is is heating up, and what you've been going through in Australia, mm. uh, you've been having it from all accounts have a really bad time. We, in our own little way, uh, and, and we in the last few weeks had it. I mean, people are going around saying, "Oh, it's intolerably hot." I mean, you would laugh at <laughs> the temperatures that we were making us say that, yeah. but nonetheless, it was the case. I also found it very interesting that when you spoke to the UK Parliamentary Committee, you talked about a need to continually debate climate sceptics in public. Some people feel like it's too late for those people to have a voice in the public debate, that the, the science is settled and we should shut them out. What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I think speech police uh, are not things to be welcomed. Uh, free speech is what you have to welcome, and, uh, and as long as they're... Uh, they um, represent a, a serious section of the community. They should be allowed to speak their piece. Um, I mean, as a broadcaster, I mean, I was involved in the BBC for a long time, and you have a responsibility to see both sides of the debate. And I'm well aware that the moment comes when you can say, look, science is this. So you just did a documentary, Climate Change, The Facts. Um, you don't think that completely closes the door on the sceptics and it's time to move on from those debates? No, no, I, I get... Um, well, this morning I got a letter from Mum and said it isn't true. Uh, and then producing actually about, about a dozen pages of, of, of graphs and right. statistics and so on. Um, and I have to say, uh, when you get two or three of those a week, <laughs> um, you say, well, look, I haven't got enough time. I am now personally convinced... The world is sick. We really have to do things about it. And there's enough time, no more time for argument. And you've been much more outspoken in recent times about the need to act on climate change. Was there a moment where you, you had a, a personal reflection and thought, I need to have a stronger voice in this debate? No, not really, because in point of fact, I've been saying it at the same sort of level, as loudly as I can, for a long time. I mean, I made a programme... Uh, at the end of the last of the last century, in the two, year 2000, which said, how many people on Earth uh, can live on Earth? No, it's about mm. population growth. Nobody took a blind bit of notice. <laughs> I've been going on about uh, global warming for at least 15 years. But there's something... You, 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 as broadcasters, we know that you can't predict actually what is going to ring the bell, as you were. There's a moment come when everything comes in the right sort of way together, and suddenly you say something, and bang, it makes, a, it makes an effect. And you can't predict what that's going to be, and you, you probably don't understand why it's that way, but it is that way. And it has been that way, particularly over, over plastic. I did a, a mm. programme called Blue Planet 2, uh, in which we showed plastic. Well, now I've been talking about plastic in the seas for, for certainly 20 years. Uh, but suddenly there was a shot of, of, of an albatross coughing up plastic, and, so, um, and everybody was motivated about plastic in the seas. Well, hooray, but, but, uh, but, it, but I've been going on about it for a long time. And recently you singled out the Australian government, and that was when you spoke to the UK Parliamentary Committee. You singled out our leaders for not doing enough on climate change, basically. Why did you feel Australia deserved a special mention there? Uh, because I, Australia, it seemed to me, was, was saying all the right things uh, pre previous governments were. 
um, and that when, and uh, you are uh, keepers of an extraordinary section of the earth, of the surface of this planet, including the barrier reef. And what you do, what you say, what you do, really, really matters. And when you've been uh, up standing and uh, and talking, what I see as the truth about what we're doing in the world, and then you suddenly say, no, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much coal we burn. Uh, or indeed saying, well, uh, there's a, this is the economic solution to some of our economic problems. But then go on to say, but we don't care a damn what it does to the rest of the world. What do you say? Yeah, well, a lot of people drew attention to the fact that our Prime Minister in his former role as Treasurer brought a, a lump of coal into the Parliament. Uh, he said it was a joke, but a lot of people didn't see it as a very I didn't, th didn't think it was a joke. And uh, if you weren't opening a coal mine, uh, okay, I would agree, that's a joke. <laughs> but you are opening a coal mine. Well, that was a very big issue in our recent election, the Adani coal mine. Um, basically, you know, Labor and the Greens were offering stronger action on climate change than the, the coalition. And um, the voters in Queensland swung towards opening the coal mine rather than taking strong action on climate change. Um, to me, that says the job of taking people with you on climate change is, is very hard as a politician. How do you think they can do that better? I don't know. Um, I mean, you just have to go on talking about it and so on. But fundamentally, uh, in the end, you, you have to appeal to, to what people I think are right. I mean, what is it, do you think it right that we go on destroying the natural world the way we are? How do we you know, convince people who, who are worried about putting food on the table or getting a job um, that they should somehow make sacrifices for the long term and, and for the planet? It's a problem, certainly. But the, but the fact of the matter is that the world is going to be running short of food. Seriously short of food. And we are going to have to change our feeding habits, our eating habits. You know, there are, there's a real danger that we, there's going to be starvation over uh, and, and famine. I mean, it's happened before. That's not, that's not a, it's kind of a, a new disaster. Because there have been famines in Africa before. But why? Because the land can't produce enough food to feed them. And that is now becoming a global problem. OK, let's talk about the younger generation. They're certainly um, a very loud voice now in the climate debate. We saw over a million school students strike for, for climate change action uh, earlier this year. Um, I'm sure those people walking out of their classrooms would love to know what you think of the stand they're taking. Do you have a message for them? Yeah, I mean, lang young people see things very clearly. I mean, the older you get, you start thinking up this, well, this, but on the other hand, there's that, and, <laughs> you know. But young people see things very clearly. Um, and they are speaking very clearly to the politicians. But if they actually do something in the way that they have been doing in this year, then politicians have to sit up and, and, and take notice. And you can say, well, it gets nowhere. Just stopping the traffic and, uh, or uh, disrupting the London life uh, gets you nowhere. It gets you noticed. Get mm. people to listen to what you say and that you're important. And they are important. They're the people who are going to inherit the mess that we've made. So do you think they have made a difference already? Yes. I, I, I think it, and, well, what the, they are part of it. And, and, and precisely what has happened is, is actually rather strange. I occasionally say there was a time in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, when civilised human beings like you and me and uh, all around the world um, thought it perfectly acceptable that you should own another human being as a slave. Mm -hmm. no? And in this period of about 15 years, not much more, suddenly it became intolerable. Suddenly, no civilised human being could actually look you in the eye and, and say it's, it's, it's perfectly morally acceptable to accept a slave. Now, it, historians will produce, produce various names, Wilberforce, this, that, and the others. But somehow or other, the whole world became absolutely clear to them that this was, this was intolerable. And I think that's happening about reactions to the way we're dealing with the planet. I honestly think that people all around the world, rich and poor and, and, and from all, all continents, are all seeing the same thing. 
this is intolerable to go on treating the natural world that we've been doing, sir. OK, but America just voted for someone who promised to take them out of the Paris Agreement in Australia. They just voted for the coalition, as we discussed yeah. earlier. Do you think this still, the tide still has a way to turn? Sure, sure, but I think it's turning. And, I mean, I've been going on about Wales or whatever for a long time, and nobody took much of a notice, but they do now. And, and, uh, and quite, quite what that is, why, I don't know. So we talked about the high school students and their activism. How radical do you think the climate change activism should be? We had the Extinction Rebellion in London this year, which shut down parts of the city for several days. Do you think that went too far, or do you think we need that kind of radical action? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. But, and, and the situation is changing all the time. The, the key, of course, is, is going to be when you actually demonstrate that, that, the, that economic future lies in this pulling it tight in the belt. When, in fact, you're, we've got to convince every part of, of civilization, of our societies, that you have to go that way and, and convince bankers and big business that actually, in the end, the long-term uh, uh, future lies in being having a healthy planet and that if, unless we do something about it, big business is going to suffer. You know, you're going to lose your money. What do you think the impact of Greta Thunberg has been the 16-year-old Swede? Well, I think it's just that. I think the politicians have... Um, um, I mean, have, let's not be too rude about politicians, but there have been politicians, both in your country and my country, who have been going on about this for a long time. So it's not as though you know, the, the greater Thunberg or me or anybody else has suddenly put it on the head, uh, put it into existence. Maybe we've moved it up the headlines a bit, but that's about it. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, it, it, they... They had to make that statement, and I'm glad they did. But now it's up to the politicians, and, and, um, they will, and young people will keep the pressure on, I'm sure. At the end of your documentary series, Blue Planet 2, there were some very strong words about needing to take personal responsibility for our everyday choices, and then those choices add up. So let's talk about those personal choices, starting with eating meat. What are your thoughts on meat eating, and has uh, this reality affected your appetite for meat? Well, yes, it ha I mean, it certainly affected my habit. I've certainly changed my, my eating habits. Um, how to disentangle that from, from my age, I don't know. Maybe everybody, when they get into their 70s, 80s or 90s, loses a taste for meat. Um, but I've certainly lost mine. I mean, I haven't eaten a steak for... I can't remember. OK, one of the other movements that seems to be starting is... Um, flight shaming, which is a translation from a, a Swedish word, and Greta Thunberg is travelling to the Americas for climate summits, um, and she's taking a sailing boat because she doesn't want to fly. Do you think we should stop flying? I, I travel. Um, I, I would hesitate to, to travel a long way for a purely trivial purpose. Uh, but if I'm travelling to do something, or well, to make a programme about climate change... Yeah. I think that's justified. And you mentioned before you've done a program on population growth and you've, you've spoken openly about the need to curb it. How do you suggest we do that? Is it, is it feeding people to the lions or having less children? Or Well, you have to, be, to start with, you have to be very, very careful about how you tell other people how they, um, how they use the privileges that they have of being a human being. Um, and uh, having children is one of the the great treasures and privileges and rewards of being alive. So you've got to be jolly careful when you, you say this. But the, all the evidence is that wherever women uh, are educated and literate and have the vote and are able to um, determine what they do and when they have children, they have medical advice to help them, that the birth rate, which is not the same as population, the birth rate falls. One of the um, great boons uh, that, that, that has come within medicine within the last is, is the ability to be able to control the, the rate at which we breed. Well, just let us use it. Your programs have helped draw attention to the plastic problem. How far do you think we have to go on plastics? What we need to do is to find out a way in which uh, we can use plastic and get rid of it 
in a, in a, a way that is not harmful and preferably in a way that is actually useful. I can't help feeling we invented the, the stuff. Surely, if it happens, we are clever enough to think of a way of disposing of it. Now, David, you've documented the life cycles of, of many species. Um, what about your own? You're at a very interesting stage of your life, and it, it doesn't seem like you're slowing down. You're still doing so much um, for someone in their 90s. How do you do it? I, I, luck is the answer. You've you got to have luck. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievably lucky. I mean, I've got dear friends who are my age or, or younger who can't walk about, you know? Um, and it's not their fault. And they can't remember things. Well, I can't remember things, but, uh, but, but seriously, you can't remember things. And, um, and, and why it, it happened to them and it has happened to me, I don't know. And it's not because I eat anything peculiar or anything. I mean, I, I have just no idea. It's luck. Is it because you've had a really deep passion that's driven you through life? Oh, lots of people have um, deep passions driving them through life. And I, 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 well, I think what would be a pity is that if you actually are able to walk around and put two words together, um, that you don't do it. I mean, um, and that society should condemn you to sitting in a chair um, knitting or something. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just extremely lucky. What are your thoughts on what happens after this life? I know a lot of people have written to you in the past asking why you don't give God the credit for the natural wonders that you've seen. Um, what do you believe in? I have no idea. I'm, a, I'm what they call an agnostic. I don't know. Um, I am quite sure that uh, the mechanism um, by which this world has become populated with all these different species of animals and plants, we understand pretty well now, um, and uh, Darwin and evolution and so on is, is, is uh, long studied and, 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 and there may be bits we don't know yet, I think that's almost certain, but by and large you know how it works. Now whether that says, whether you say that means that God doesn't exist is, not, is, is, is another question. I don't believe that the first man actually complained to God that he hadn't got a partner uh, and God said, all right, well, in that case, lie down and I'll take your rib and, I'll, and, and then I'll, I'll blow into it and you've got a part. I don't believe that. I mean, it well may be that there is a creator, overall creator spirit that we don't know about. I, I have no idea. And whether there's a life after death, I have no idea. Are you scared of dying? No, I just hope it won't be painful. <laughs> and I hope it won't be tiresome for, for others, you know. Have your views on how this world came to be and what happens to us after we pass away. Have they, they changed much through the course of your life, given what you've seen? Not really. I never believed that Genesis was literally true. Um, as a boy, I, 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 come on. Sir David Attenborough, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure.